With the show as massively successful as Batman the Animated Series, it's almost a certainty that not every idea the writers cook up ends up making its way into production. I'm Maddie Washburn from the Watchtower Database, and today we're taking a look at over 20 Batman episodes that almost happened. This is part of a multi-part series. So, if you missed the first part, where we talked about everything that didn't make it into season one, from the writer's bible, to Batmite, to the gun that was used to kill the Waynes, you're gonna want to make sure you check that one out as well. And definitely be sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out when we cover lost episodes from other DC Comics cartoons as well. Hell, while you're down there, you might as well hit the like button. It helps push the video to other folks who also may be interested in it. But now that we've got that all out of the way, let's jump into what you all came here for. Alternate Universes. After I had already recorded for the first episode in this series, Joe Davis of the LA-based sketch comedy podcast, The Final Edition Radio Hour, got in touch to share some notes that he had saved up from his time running the Justice League Watchtower fan site back in the early 2000s under the pseudonym of Karkle. Among his notes was a posting from Paul Dini's Live Journal account. For those of you younger folks in the audience, Audience, Live Journal was one of the first blogging platforms on the internet. Kind of like Blogspot? No, wait, that one's old too. Kind of like Tumblr. Don't tell me that one's been forgotten to time as well. Frick, I'm getting old. Nevertheless, the posting said the jokester from Dini's then current run on DC's Countdown was originally a character he had left over from his days on Batman the Animated Series that he was never able to use. Paul further expanded on the jokester's potential appearance in the comments section saying, I was playing around with the crime syndicate like alternate world for the original Batman animated series, but we decided to ground the first couple of seasons in real world stories, so we never did the mirror universe slash earth 3 type story. In the notes I made at the time, I created an anti-hero Joker, a comedian who spoke out against the criminal Batman of that world and was disfigured by the evil Batman in return. Many of the freedom fighters of that alternate Gotham were mirror versions of our own world's criminals who had been hurt, crippled, and scarred in some way by that evil Batman. I never formally picked the story, so I only now got a chance to pull it out of my notebooks and offer it up here for Countdown. Of course, the fascistic multiverse counterparts to our main DCAU heroes did end up making their way into Superman the Animated Series and Justice League, as well as the cancelled Worlds Collide film that ended up becoming Crisis on Two Earths. So as interesting as this concept is, in my opinion, it may have just been one too many of these kinds of stories once all was said and done. Also for season one is the long fabled Sandman episode. Admittedly, I was under the impression that this was going to be a season two episode due to Neil Gaiman himself saying he was talking to Dini about the possibility in 1993 after Vertigo came into existence, but according to the graphic novel Dark Knight, A True Batman Story, which chronicles Dini's time on the show and I highly suggest you read, the pitch came around during his time writing for Mask of the Phantasm, which was in production concurrently with season one. The pitch, as detailed by Dini, would have gone like this. This story opens with Batman having the fight of his life. He's been lured to some remote spot in Gotham. Joker is holding some society bigwigs hostage. When Batman arrives, not only is Joker there, but so is every other one of his major enemies. It's a trap and they all want a piece of him. Ivy snares Batman in thorny vines that shoot out of the ground. The Scarecrow hits Batman with his fear gas, while both Clayface and Killer Croc move in to beat the crap out of him. Batman breaks free, but everywhere he turns, there's a villain taking shots at him. Joker is loving this. He tells Batman that Harley Quinn is really holding the hostages at his hideout. Batman doesn't have a prayer of rescuing them or even getting out of this alive. This is it, Joker tells him. The big villain team up where they all band together to kill their common enemy. Somehow, Batman fights his way to the Batmobile. He's badly wounded. Maybe he's even taken a bullet if we can get away with it. First thing he does is call Robin and give him the location of the hostages. Just then, he hears something ticking and it's a Riddler puzzle bomb stuck to his windshield. Batman hits the seat ejector just as the bomb goes off. Woo! He's shot sky high and barely manages to clamp his grapple onto a gargoyle way up on the side of a building. The grapple pulls Batman up and he just hangs there, hovering between life and death. Then we're inside the Dreaming, the Sandman's kingdom. Batman comes to and finds he's in a sort of negative space. No villains, no Gotham, no pain for that matter. Nothing except him and a girl. Death. 
It seems that Death and the Sandman are siblings in a sort of dysfunctional family of states of human consciousness. That part's complicated, a little too much for 22 minutes. Anyway, Death naturally tells the cheetah he's dodged her for the last time. Now she will finally eat him over to the other side. That's when Morpheus the Sandman appears. He tells his sister that Batman is his guest in his realm, and he asks Death to spare him for now. Of course, Batman has no idea what these two are talking about. He only knows he's in the middle of some insane dream brought about by his injuries. Death's not happy, but family is family. So she hangs back while Morpheus tells Batman he's responsible for more dreams than he knows. Dreams of Batman in all forms pervade human minds. Acting like a ghost out of Dickens' A Christmas Carol, Morpheus shows Batman how his image haunts the dreams of the wicked, scaring more than a few of them into giving up crime. Sandman also reveals how Batman has instilled dreams of hope in the people he saved. In his own way, Batman is a powerful agent of the dreaming. These revelations are things Batman admits he may have felt on some level, but he's always pushed them aside in his mind in order to concentrate on his mission. Morpheus tells Batman he stands at a crossroad. He can can follow death to an eternal rest, or he can allow Morpheus to wake him. Neither choice is wrong, only Batman may make the choice. Batman knows waking means he has to deal with pain, but he also knows he will heal. He chooses to live. There is a bright light, and Batman recoils in pain. Then, he's back on the gargoyle, barely hanging on. But we see the light is coming from the Batwing, and it's Robin flying down to rescue him. And the upshot is Batman survives and goes on because that's what he does. During their conversations, Deanie and Gaiman both expressed interest in John Hurt playing the role of the Sandman. But when the episode never ended up happening, Gaiman assumed it was due to a lack of interest from the animated series crew, or a divide between Vertigo and DC that was mandated by their editorial boards in order to not pressure younger readers into feeling as though they may need to pick up mature titles for the sake of continuity. However, by Deanie's account, Alan Burnett turned it down because he felt it was too metaphysical lacked action, and probably couldn't get the name Death past the censors. Of course, now that Warner Animation has moved a lot of their DC output to direct-to-video releases, as well as streaming services like DC Universe and HBO Max, now seems like the perfect time for Dini to revive the pitch. Especially with the fact that Death got her own short on the recent Wonder Woman Bloodlines home release, and Deathstroke's Knights and Dragons miniseries is getting the animated movie treatment soon. Which, you know, because he's got Death in his name they couldn't they couldn't call him Slade on Teen Titans because of that or they couldn't call him Deathstroke on Teen Titans that's what I meant but speaking of time I think it's about time we moved on to season two and more well hey it's that part of the video where we always say the names of the patrons but I ran into a pretty big fan they agreed to come on to the show to help me out with this so long as we both wear masks so hold on just a second Obviously, we still got to social distance a little bit. Let's say these names. Do you want to? Do you want to start? Okay, he's a little shy. First up, we have our new patrons, David Robertson. He really he he said he wanted to do this. Ian Moore, Danny Holt, Silver, Maggie. Up next, we have people who have upped their patronage. Philip Boylard. Oh, okay, he says don't say Boyland. Got it. Yeah, Philip Boylard. Then of course, we have the people that we always say. Dark Poet, 1792. Robert Sterling, Aaron Young, Cameo Shadowness, David Gallagher, Luke Mears, Mac. Are you sure you don't want to say any of them? Richard Mon 12. That's it. That's all the patrons. Thanks to this big fan for helping out. Thank you for having me on. Hopefully the edit can make that even funnier than what's going on right here. <laughs> now, just to get this out of the way, there are a lot of episodes that we don't have too much information on. So it's possible that some of these ideas may have actually been kicking around since the first season. If more info comes to light to suggest that, don't get mad at me for structuring things to work with what we've got. We good? Okay, good. When Fox renewed Batman the Animated Series for its fall 1994 season, according to Cinefantastique magazine, they insisted on less emphasis on its film noir, dark, angry attitude, less introspection, more humor, more larger than life adventure, and 
more of Robin. While I'd argue that it's up in the air that they followed that mandate to a T, there's no denying that there was more Robin by that point. In fact, as we brought up in our Birds of Prey video a while back, the studio was so strict on that mandate that it even cost the fans a potential episode with Black Canary, as Paul Dini explained in the book Batman Animated. A potentially intriguing Catwoman slash Black Canary team up was interrupted in mid-pitch to the network by their demand. Where's Robin? When the writers asked if they could omit Robin from just this one episode, Fox obliged by omitting the entire story. Of course, Canary isn't the only guest character that ended up getting the shaft. In this interview for Back Issue, Deanie also reveals that he also really wanted to do a story about Poison Ivy enslaving Swamp Thing and forcing him to fight Batman. Unfortunately, the rights to Swamp Thing weren't available at the time, so he sat on that idea until 2017 when it was repurposed for the Justice League action episode, Garden of Evil. Coincidentally, this was the same year that we finally got a DCAU meeting of the two characters. Another potential guest spot would have been given to the Creeper, parentheses, Jack Ryder, close parentheses. While he eventually joined the DCAU canon in 1998 during the run of The New Batman Adventures, Alan Burnett revealed in Comic Scene Magazine number 29 that they were actively trying to incorporate him as early as October of 1992. So we're trying to develop a story right now with the creeper we figure it'll look flashy to have a yellow guy jumping around this dark deco city 12 years later, in 2004, Bruce Tim revealed during his interview for Modern Masters that the crew had gone back and forth on it with multiple writers, but could just never reach a point to where they were happy with it. Apparently, the overall consensus at the time was that spending a single episode with the character just didn't feel like enough to handle his origin while also allowing room for a plot involving Batman. Luckily, they finally figured it out by the time the show was revamped, and we ended up with not only a fan favorite episode, but also this really cool Bruce Tim drawn design that serves as a reminder of what could have been. A few other interesting guest episodes were hinted at over time, like one with Huntress, as confirmed by Wizard Magazine number 31, and the Cavalier, who, while he showed up much later on in Batman Adventures Volume 2, Paul Dini at one point suggested they would probably get around to telling his story sooner or later in the animated series, though Martin Pasco would beg to disagree. There was another villain called the Cavalier, who was essentially a French musketeer mm -hmm. in the costume, you know, the, the plumed hat and so on. That was, that'll look silly. On top of those, there were even potentially going to be appearances from Batman 66 characters like King Tut, Egghead, and Bookworm. But according to Paul Dini, they ultimately didn't pan out due to rights issues. That didn't let the showrunners stop them from making the King Tut story that they wanted to though, as Dan Reba explained on Batman the Animated Podcast. We really kind of wanted to do King Tut, but King Tut was owned by Fox. It's, oh it's yeah. part of the TV show. DC didn't own King Tut, so we were like, ah. And we're like, oh, their version of King Tut was Maxi Zeus, so let's let's do that. Yeah. Of course, the Adam West TV show isn't the only piece of Batman's broadcast history that the crew wanted to explore. While The Dark Knight never rose to the radio show popularity of The Man of Steel, he did receive brief radio treatment in the 1950s when a pilot was produced for The Batman Mystery Club. But even before then, the Cape Crusader showed up on The Adventures of Superman radio show in 1945, three years into the show's run. While working on Batman the Animated Series, Paul Dini wanted to pay respects to this history and pitched an episode that would have served as a lost Batman radio pilot, featuring the animated series cast. Unfortunately, due to a number of internal reasons, such as cost, music rights, and distribution, the episode never ended up into the show. Dini also had an idea for a Harley meets Baby doll story, but ultimately, never wrote it due to concern the two characters may cancel each other out. Though, I suppose had his proposed Harley spinoff come to light, maybe there would have been room for it. It was animated, it was something that uh, I, I developed for a while and ultimately it was not what Warners wanted at the time, but uh, it would have been fun. It would have been a little bit more extreme, but it would have uh, 
spun those characters off into, into some of their own adventures. Ending our streak of Dini-related content, it was revealed in the Paul Dini and Chip Kidd authored Batman Animated that at one point, another spinoff was in the works, this time with a focus on Catwoman. The story was reported on in January 1993 by Wizard Magazine, with a potential Robin spinoff being mentioned alongside the Catwoman show the following month. But by March of 93, Wizard reported that production on both potential series stalled. In his 2004 interview with Modern Masters, Bruce Tim went into further detail as to what ended up happening. It was all very vague. When Batman Returns came out, there was a lot of talk about spinning Catwoman into her own movie. We were coming to the close of our first run of Batman episodes, and we said, well, what are we going to do next? There were a number of proposals. We talked about the possibility of doing a Robin spinoff show, which didn't terribly appeal to me, although we did come up with a little bit of development artwork on it. And the other possibility was because of the popularity of the Catwoman character from the movie, we thought maybe we could do a Catwoman spinoff TV show. We talked about it a little bit, what would the premise be, and what would make it visually different from Batman, but I'm not sure if it was ever really pitched anywhere. I never pitch it to any executives, and I think it just died of inertia. While the series never ended up happening, ideas for it did seem to have a potential place in the second season of Batman, as Wizard reported in November of 93 that Catwoman would be redefined to give the character a meaner edge, and was echoed by Comic Scene Magazine the following February, claiming new stories involve a term turning point in the relationship between Batman and Catwoman, as well as Cinefantastique magazine, who shared a character design from the series that they asserted would show up in an episode where Selina had more of an outlaw personality. While the new character model ended up as a for sale animation cell in the long gone Warner Brothers store, the redesign, spin-off series, and even the outlaw episode unfortunately never ended up on our TV screens. Okay, we've still got a lot to cover and I haven't even gotten to the the big one yet. Extremely dangerous. Keep out of reach of children. So I guess it's time for a speed run. These lost episodes we don't have a lot of info on, so let's see how quickly we can get through them all. On multiple occasions, Alan Burnett has said he wanted to do an episode with no dialogue titled Silent Night, based on Neil Adams' The Silent Night of the Batman. While this never came to pass, a similar idea was the foundation of the Chase Me short packaged with mystery of the Batwoman. Alan has also stated he was interested in an exploration into Batman's sex life, though obviously that would have been impossible to get past the censors. One script, written by Mitch Bryan, saw Batman intentionally getting himself locked in Stonegate in an attempt to solve a crime, but the whole thing turns out to be a setup as Batman is bounced around from villain to villain trying to escape. Mitch still had the script as of his appearance on Batman the Animated Podcast last year, so we'll let you know if we're able to weasel a copy out of him. Be sure you're subscribed subscribed or you'll just never know. Joe Lansdale, writer of Critters, the best Batman episode, among other Batman the Animated Series classics, had an episode they were trying to work on with another writer, potentially Paul Dini, about a group of guys trying to capture or kill Batman with traps and gimmicks. A synopsis was made with several revisions to it, and while the basic premise sounds just about like any other episode of the series. Lansdale says there were several other elements that he's since forgotten, but still has faith in the premise to this day. Robert N. Skier had a story about a gang kid that kind of fell through the cracks. Kevin Altieri wanted to do Batman vs. Dracula. Hero Illustrated reported in December 1993 that we could be looking forward to seeing Batman's nemesis, Azriel. This one seems a bit weird to me because it's generally well known that Bruce Timm wasn't a huge fan of the backbreaking storyline that brought Azriel to prominence in the comics. Additionally, Wizard Magazine specifically stated that Azrael was going to be a no-show in their March 1994 issue, so who knows. Returning to Batman Animated, the book says that there were at least half a dozen full or partially completed stories in their dead script file that proved ultimately too complex or too silly to produce. Marty Eisenberg shared on Batman the Animated Podcast that there were a couple where the Riddler tried to logic his way into figuring out Batman's identity, one where a clue to his location involved the Pythagorean theory and he even gave details to one that had been reported on years ago in Wizard Magazine that would have revealed how the Riddler woke up from his coma. 
I in particular was trying to come up with a kind of a sequel to, to what is reality where we wake up the Riddler from his coma. And I think I was pitching it around that time. I never really worked it out, but the, the idea was it was gonna be almost a combination of Awakenings and Silence of the Lambs. And the idea was that there are these Riddler crimes that are going on while the Riddler's in a coma, so it can't possibly be him. That's such a cool idea for an episode. But they <laughs> need him to help figure, to help catch the real criminal whatever, something's at stake, something's, you know, there's some ticking clock that, you know, the half of Gotham's gonna blow up or something. Right. The idea was that the only thing that he was responding to was Batman. That would get him to move or, or you, they would get the brain waves or whatever. What the Riddler had been doing was surreptitiously hypnotizing the uh, the staff and the, the, the doctors and giving them post-hypnotic suggestion. So he was actually making them commit the crimes and then the finale was that you know, he'd hypnotize Batman and, and, and Batman was committing the crimes and somehow he would thwart him in some to be determined way. But I never could quite get it to all feel complete. It's like, it's a great idea, but I couldn't figure out how does it all tie together. <laughs> execute it and it, it drove me crazy because I, I really wanted to do it. And topping off our speed run, Marty Eisenberg revealed that he was working on a Hugo Strange story that was dropped. There was a story in the comics at the time, the um, I think it was Legends of the Dark Knight, that was that was to kind of reimagine Hugo Strange as, as this psychologist who became obsessed with Batman, started to believe he was Batman. So we did we did a riff on that one that didn't really go anywhere. And now that we've come to a close on all of those tiny tidbits, it's time to get to the one you've all been waiting for. Nocturna and the Vampire Batman. This is perhaps one of the most notorious lost episodes of the series. Over the years, it's been brought up by Alan Burnett, Bruce Timm, and a small handful of other members of the series production crew. Inspired by a quote from Bob Kane, where he said, Batman is half Dracula and half Zorro, Bruce Timm has stated that he always wanted to go all the way with it and actually make him a vampire. While that's something he was able to finally do in Justice League Gods and Monsters, his inspiration for it actually went as far back as Batman the Animated Series. Looking to the comics for inspiration, Tim turned to Nocturna, introduced in 1983. The idea was to take her long soap opera styled story that ran through both Detective Comics and the mainline Batman title and condense it to one finite two-part story. Story. Bruce drew up a character model of the villainous and began to bat around story ideas with one of the other writers on staff. Alan went to pitch the story to the network, who were quick to tell him no. No bloodletting, no biting Batman's neck, no Batman searching through Gotham for blood, no vampires, just no. Attempts were made to soften the gore in order to get the story through, as Bruce brought up in his interview with Modern Masters. Well, what if we... no... What if we never see fangs? Now, uh, what if Nocturna bites Batman? It's all in the shadows. No, no vampires, period. And reiterated again more recently in back issue number 99. Well, what if it was, we came up with all different kinds of rationalizations and they said, nope, flat out, no, no vampires, you can't do it. So that was it. It wasn't like, oh, the great unmade episode. We just kind of had a notion. We we didn't actually have the whole story worked out or anything, but at the same time, we were kind of like, ah, that's disappointing. For a while, the only known story beats were that Nocturna bites Batman, who would return home after the fight. The next morning, Alfred comes in and pulls the curtains as Bruce's skin starts to bubble, burn, and smoke. Given that Tim had said they didn't have the whole story worked out, you'd think that's where this all ends. But while we were developing this video, we got in touch with friend of the channel, back issue writer John Trumbull, to compare notes. And surprisingly, he told us that despite Tim saying they didn't have a full story, there had actually been much more detail given back in the 90s via Comic Scene Magazine. Amazingly, this info seems to have eluded almost any publication that's brought up the story in the time since. So sit back and enjoy the long lost tale of Nocturna as explained by Bruce Timm in Comic Scene Magazine number 46. It was going to be a two-part episode involving a really sick love story. Nocturna falls in love with Batman and wants to vampirize him so that they can live together eternally as vampires. She puts the bite on him at the first episode's end. Bruce Wayne wakes up the next morning and says, Oh boy, how did I ever get home? Alfred tells him, I found you and dragged you home. Good thing you're safe now. 
Bruce feels like he has a really bad hangover, Alfred pulls open the blinds, and Bruce starts shrieking because his skin is on fire. He looks in the mirror and sees that he has vampire fangs. The second episode was going to focus on Batman trying to cure himself of the vampire taint. We were going to say he wasn't a supernatural vampire, but a biological vampire with a chemical substance in his bloodstream. He's in the Batcave frantically trying to cure himself, and at the same time, he's looking at Alfred thinking, God, he looks really tasty. He's about to attack Alfred and then realizes, this is horrible, I'm not gonna have time to cure myself of being a vampire. I'll have to destroy myself before I'm a danger to anybody. Alfred says, just calm down, you're too distraught to cure yourself. I'll go get Kirk Langstrom, the scientist who turns into Man-Bat. He's the best guy to help you, just lie down and relax. Bruce tries to relax, but he can't control the bloodlust. Batman goes out to Gotham City looking for victims when he realizes at the last minute that he must cure himself. That was as far as we got, but we thought that would make a great two-parter. Despite Fox's refusal to pick up the story, it seems that it was pitched a second time when the show was revamped to the new Batman Adventures for Kids WB. According to the Unused Villains Database fan site, when asked about Nocturno while on the WB network, Paul Dini responded, We'd like to use her, but the network still says no to vampires. This was also reported in Wizard issue number 92, which stated that both Fox and WB said no to the episode. But with a vampire, Empire being promised for Batman the adventures continue? Who knows? Maybe there's still a chance for us to see Nocturna after all. As most of you can probably tell, this is being filmed on a different day. Last time I wore this shirt, a lot of people got upset. It's a punk band that's been around for like 40 years. They were on like Lizzie McGuire, so you know, calm down. <laughs> I just wanted to say before I go, we got a lot of help on this video from some YouTube friends of ours, some new friends. So I wanted to, to shout them out before we get out of here. Thank you to The Surfs for being our voice of Paul Dini. Thank you to Vadim of Creationist Cat for being our Bruce Tim. I watch both of you guys a lot. So getting to have both of you on this video was, <laughs> was a lot of fun. It's been great. Sorry if I uh, annoyed you by just consistently checking up on things. I love you guys. The surfs came in last second to do that read. I very much appreciate it. We had Owen from Owen Likes Comics come in and do the Sandman synopsis, which was technically narrated by Paul Dini. We can have two different Paul Dinis. There's no problem with that. We also had Drake from the Comic Drake YouTube channel come in, do the Nocturna synopsis. It's always great getting to work with you guys, especially Drake, just because I've been watching you for years, man. Awesome having y'all. And we had a fifth guest, my boy, Ryan from Gray Fox. James, James can probably put a picture of me kissing him on the screen somewhere. Ryan's been a longtime friend of mine. He just recently got started doing YouTube. I was in a music video of his. It was a lot of fun having all these people on. All of their links are gonna be down below. Check them out and give them a subscribe. Definitely subscribe to Ryan because I love him. He is my my good my good friend and I love him. I wanna wanna mwah. Kiss him. Lots of kisses for all of these guys. We got a lot more Lost Batman episodes coming up, right? This is a multi-part series. Well, we had three more full scripts that we had to, to break down and this video was already running way too long. And then the world's finest dropped a bunch more Lost scripts. So we got scripts for days that I gotta, I gotta consolidate into a video for you guys. Bunch of uh, potential almost movies that happened. And of course, you know, we're gonna be doing Lost episode videos on all of the other DCAU shows. There's always lost episodes there always is if you're looking forward to that stick around hit the hit the subscribe button let's get this video to 30,000 likes right <laughs> <laughs> this kind of feels like doing vanishing point again right like I love you guys and I'll see y'all in the next one no I can't tell them to kiss people we gotta socially distant if you're in quarantine with a loved one I guess you can kiss them but like other than that keep your hands to yourself smash that like button <laughs>